Welcome to another episode of The Heart Chamber. I am your host, Boots Knighton. Today I interview Bellin Blanton, who was born with tricuspid atresia in Caracas, Venezuela back in 1965. When she was born, many doctors told her mom that she was not going to make it. Fortunately, her mother took her to a cardiologist that had contact with Houston Children's Hospital in Texas, where she had surgery called the POTS shunt procedure, which was performed by the famous Dr. Denton Cooley. From age 15, she began to experience complications, including arrhythmia. When she was 21 years old, she immigrated to the United States. And from age 30, she began to experience atrial fibrillation, endocarditis, and Eisenmenger syndrome, as well as pulmonary hypertension. She is truly a miracle before us. It was just such a treat to speak with her. Even in her 50s, she is living with heart failure, but making a difference and living her life as vibrantly as she can anyway. I think you'll really enjoy this conversation. She shares a lot about a nonprofit that she has started in Venezuela to help children who have been born with congenital heart defects. And she also talks about her work with other organizations. I sure do appreciate you spending a moment of your time with me today. You can find me at theheartchamberpodcast.com. There you can leave me a note in the contact form or you can leave me a voicemail. I'd love to hear from you if you have a story you would like to share on this podcast. You can also find me on Instagram at the Heart Chamber Podcast. And thank you so much for your support. I surely appreciate it. Let's get to it. You have an incredible story. There's a lot of different things I want to touch on today. You are a heart warrior yourself, and I want to talk about that. And then, and you know, where you're, where you're from, how you came to the United States. And then I want to dive into all the incredible work you're doing now to help fellow heart warriors, not just in the United States, but globally. So you're such a force of nature. It is such a miracle you are still with us at 57 years old. But let's let's start back at the beginning. Welcome to the Heart Chamber. Let's just dive right on in. Okay. Thank you for having me. So you were born in Venezuela. Yes, I was born in Venezuela in 1965. I was born in a very, you know, small hospital. Then I went home. Everything was okay. But my mom, she was a nurse. And she started to notice that, you know, my, my lips will get purple in my hands. So for her, it was like something very strange until I have my first crisis that, you know, I start to, I couldn't breathe. And my mom performed, you know, CPR. So she decided to take me to the, to the cardiologist. And they took me to a cardiologist. We're talking about the 60s. So, you know, it was, and in Venezuela, it was like, what is this? So they took me there and they um, find out that I was born with a, tri- you know, without a tricuspid valve. But in that time, they didn't know a lot of things about it. So we went, my mom went with me, doctor to doctor, doctor to doctor. And in the, at the same time, I was having a lot of crisis and a lot of bad stuff that it was you know, really killing me, you know, little by little. Until we met a doctor because our neighbors told us, told my parents about a doctor that just arrived from the Texas Children's Hospital. So we went to see him there in in Venezuela. He was a cardiologist in Venezuela. We went to see him and he just, you know, he took the case for him and he said, we're going to save her. I don't care what other people said. They told my mom that I would never arrive to the to the airplane and I will make it to the air, that I will not make it to Texas. But my cardiologist, I couldn't get, you know, like oxygen inside the plane. Talking about the 60s. And he made like a little chamber. It was like a like a bassinet, but it was a chamber where he put the stuff to, for me to get oxygen. How old were you when you were on this flight? Six months old. And let's let's Six name months. your cardiologist here. 
that he's my well he, he's no longer with us but he's like my dad mm -hmm. his name is Ivan Machado mm -hmm. Atias he was the one that saved my life when everybody say no he's he took it for him you know so we went there when we arrived to you know by the way Delta Airlines were so wonderful with my parents at the beginning they didn't you know they were talking about the house I was going to get the oxygen and all that stuff and everything but then you know the captain seeing the situation you know took the risk and you know they took me to Texas. When I got to Texas, they were, you know, the ambulance, everybody, they were waiting for, for my parents in the airport. So I went straight to the, to the hospital. I got my surgery with uh, Dr. Denton Cooley, mm -hmm. which, you know, he, he, he was amazing. I remember, well, I don't remember, but I remember my mom used to tell me that when he, when Dr. Cooley came out of the um, surgery, is say, Mr. and Mrs. Altuve, you don't have to worry about anything. Oh <laughs> Everything is fixed. And it wasn't, but back then, you but know. Back then, it, it, it they was, did the best they could. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. just a simple shunt. Mm -hmm. So I went back to Venezuela. My family treated me like a little doll. I couldn't do anything. <laughs> I couldn't, you know, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't run. I couldn't do this and be careful with Belen. All my family, my aunts, my uncles, everybody. I was like a spoiled one. Be careful. Don't scare her, you know, but in a lot of love. I never felt overwhelmed or anything. I had a normal childhood, of course. You know, a lot of, you have a lot of um, things that you can do. But uh, my family was so wonderful. So when I was like 14 years old, I was I was preparing to do my quinceañera, and I had my first crisis. I mean, it was like almost a heart attack. And what is what and were you? I tell went, me a little bit more about what you were preparing for again. I was preparing for a party. A party, like you know, the Sweet Sixteen here. Okay. Yes. You yes. know the whole, but in but in Venezuela. In, in South America, like in Mexico too, is when you're 15. Oh, okay. It's like a, yeah, it is like a, an event. You know, the girl get dressed, you know, like the Cinderella. Uh -huh. And you invite all your friends and your family, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. But I got, before that, I got really sick. And they thought that that was the end. And I don't know, I... I remember I was 14 and I have this thing, you know, I was having like a terrible AFib and I passed out and everything and everybody was screaming and, you know, I didn't understand what it was happening because my parents never told me everything about my condition because they didn't want me to live my life with fear, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. In a way, sometimes I feel like, why didn't you tell me maybe, you know, I will have found something else but now I understand they because now I see the girls that they are 15 and they have CHD congenital heart disease how they are mm -hmm. and I wasn't that way at all I was like oh yeah my my heart is weird but it's okay everything is fine you know I was like so I was in the hospital for like two two or three weeks and that's when I started to take quinine you know that old pill that is for arrhythmias. Okay. And I start to take, that was the first time that I started to take medicine. So, you know, when I was like 15, well, the day of my birthday, my 15th birthday party, everybody, every, you know, that you have to dance with your dad and then with the people that you love and all that stuff. I remember that everybody was sobbing, crying, looking at me, and I'm like, why everybody's crying? It's because they were so excited that, you know, that I made it. Mm -hmm. It's a so, big deal. Yeah, I remember that my my cardiologist was there in the party and he danced with me. And I will never forget that he told me in my ear, you always, always will be my little star of Bethlehem. Um, because my name is Belen, that's mm -hmm. Bethlehem in English. Okay. So he told me, you will always be my little star of Bethlehem and I'm like oh my god so you know I continued to go to the high school everything was perfect 
I did a lot of, you know, like a teenager, a lot of crazy stuff that I shouldn't, but, you know, I didn't know better. So when I was 17, again, I had an AFib that almost killed me. That one, I remember that day like it was yesterday. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't do anything. And I just, you know, I start to to feel, like, you know, when, you, when you're when you just going to pass out. And mm-hmm. I kind of pass out, but I will never forget that I saw my mom running to the doctor and getting down in her knees and just telling, telling the doctor, please save her. I do whatever, but please. And I remember that the only thing that I could think in my mind, it was, I can't die. Not for me. It's because I don't want my mom to suffer. That's the only thing that I was in my mind. And then I have these weird things. I don't know if I die or if I didn't die. But I have this weird thing that I felt like I was like flying. It was like really weird. And I saw my godfather that he was dead. And he told me, you still have a lot of things going on in your life. And I remember that's when I heard that they were doing a cardioversion. Boom! You know, I heard that. And I opened my eyes and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm alive. I'm alive. It's the only thing. And I will tell the doctor, you can't let me die. You can't let me die. And the doctors told my mom, we never thought that she was going to make it. I think her attitude in life is so wonderful. And she's such a happy lady, you know, young girl, that she's still here. Of course, back then in the 80s, already the Glen and the Fontan were available. However, in Venezuela, we didn't know that. Mm-hmm. And I was living there. And then I started to take other, uh, that's when I started to take Lanoxin after that. And then when I was like 19, I went to law school <laughs> after I get out of uh, high school, but I hated it. When did you immigrate from no. Venezuela? Uh, 1987. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. So when I was in Venezuela, when I got out of uh, high school, I went to uh, law school and I hated it because I just wanted to be, I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to be a singer. I wanted to, you know, do crazy things. So I got out of the college. I didn't want to study. Then my dad, I don't care what you do, but you got to study because, you know, for me, it's very important. And I said, dad, I want to go to England because I want to learn English. But I wanted to go to England. And my dad, are you crazy? You in England? Just look at the way that you put your hair because I was like kind of punk. (laughs) 80s, you know? Yeah, totally. (laughs) And then my dad, I just can see you in Carnaby Street with all these crazy people. And I'm like, I said, well, you know, whatever, but I, I need to. One of the main things that I wanted to do, I wanted to leave my house because I wanted to do things for me. You know, I always was so spoil that I didn't even know how to fry an egg I mean I didn't know anything everything was done for me so I was like I wanted to be independent Mm -hmm. when all my brothers my brother and my sister they were teen all of them they got a car I didn't get a car are you crazy Belen with a car you know she came and whatever her heart something happened and then you know I was like I got to get out of here. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I have. You were feeling suffocated. Well, so lucky. Yes. Mm-hmm. But suffocated, but loved. So, you know, I couldn't get upset with them because, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I have a, I had a bond with my mom that we didn't even have to talk because, you know, we knew each other so well. So when my mom got sick, well, that's later on. And so finally, my dad told me, I have a business partner. That is a very good friend of the family. That his daughter, his daughter lives in 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 Raleigh, North Carolina. You can go to NC State and you can learn English and then come back. And guess what? Say, okay. Guess what? Okay. I went to NC State. No, I, you're kidding me. I went to NC State. Mm-hmm. <laughs> See? See, we're See? meant to be. We're meant to be our so, buddies. <laughs> yeah, I went. I went to. To my English classes wearing the Harrelson. Oh my know? gosh. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, 
remember. So my dad say, okay, but it's going to be just six. It's going to be four months and then you come back. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, okay. So, <laughs> so, you know, I studied English. It was four months and I told my dad that you're going to lose your money because, you know, I still don't know. You know, I don't know English very well. I have to learn more. <laughs> and then I said, I, I've, you know, and then I started to take like business classes. But it was too expensive because, you know, for foreigners, it was very expensive. So I was like, I need to find something. So guess what? I found out about Wake Technical Community College in Raleigh. Mm -hmm. So they had English classes and they were free, the English classes back then. And then I started to study computer operations. That's when the whole era of computer was started, which, you know, I can't use my career because it's RPG and all this old stuff, DOS and all oh, that. <laughs> that 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 definitely oh my doesn't God. date you. <laughs> no. What years were you at and, Wake? Uh, I was in Wake Tech from eighty-eight to ninety-one. And oh my God, created a community of people all over the world. But the the good thing about it and that I love, it was like I didn't want to have any Latin friends. I wanted to have American friends because I wanted to learn English. Mm -hmm. I even went out with a guy. I don't know what the guy told me. I don't know. He could have told me, you know, a lot of stuff, but I didn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't understand. I was like, just, you know, like, whatever. But I will travel to Venezuela to go and see my cardiologist. I never saw a cardiologist here in the United States. Then I start to stay, stay. Then I got a job. Then they asked me if I can work in the bank industry. So I start to work for Wachovia, where it used to be First Union. Mm -hmm. You remember in mm -hmm. North I do. Carolina? Mm -hmm. okay, I worked for a lot, you know, many years there. And but my heart was doing okay. Sometimes I will have like a little, ch -ch -ch -ch, but I was like, ah, everything's okay. I will take my pill. And I'm telling you, I didn't know what I had. And in the meantime, you know, this Eisenmenger syndrome was developing. Mm -hmm. But it's because I didn't know. I didn't have a clue. Since you just mentioned the Eisenberg, Eisen, how did we say it again? Mm -hmm. I looked it up. Isomenger. Isomenger yeah. syndrome. Yeah. So that is the first I had ever heard of that um, when you initially told me about this. So you're starting to develop it. You don't know it yet, but let's just educate our listeners real quick about what that is. Well, the Isomenger syndrome is um, when a person with one single ventricle doesn't get the other repair. Uh, you know, surgeries, it, it affects your lungs, and then you get a pulmonary hypertension. Okay. And then the only way that it could be no cure, because it will never be able to be cured, is with transplant. But it will have to be heart and lung transplant. Got it. It's the only way. Okay. Just, you know, right now, medicine... It has advanced a lot. So in the past, Eisenmenger, people didn't even make it to the 30s. Okay. And, you know, right now with medicine, it's better. Okay, thanks. Um, so you're starting to develop yeah. it, but you don't know it yet. I didn't know. Okay. A, I got married. I, you know, I have my, I, I have my, um, my, I was with my, that was my first husband because <laughs> this is my second husband. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we had a kid. Everything was okay. That's amazing um, you had a child and carried the child to term. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we then, you know, I got divorced and then uh, things happened. I I moved from Raleigh and moved to Charlotte. Mm -hmm. And they offered me to work for Bank of America. So I was working there and everything. And one time I had a, a cousin that lived here in Jacksonville, Florida. And it was the only family that I had. And I felt so lonely in Charlotte because I didn't have a family anymore. So I decided to move here to Jacksonville. One of the days that I moved, to, that I came here to find out an apartment and all that stuff, I started to develop AFib. But I mean, days with AFib. And I, you know, I was like, ah, it will go away. 
enough. So that was the first time that I went to a cardiologist here in the United States. Of course, when the cardiologist saw me almost pass out, it was like, wow, what? And that's when I started to take a amiodarone. You okay. know that medicine, amiodarone? Mm -hmm. Okay. And it was pretty bad. So, but with amiodarone, it calmed down the whole thing. I moved here to Jacksonville. I was in Jacksonville and I was doing okay with my amiodarone. And um, suddenly I started to have fever and fever and fever. And I, I, you know, I went to the hospital and they would do like, see if I have UTI, nothing. So I called my cardiologist in Venezuela, which right now is, that, is another, it, this one was my EP, my electrophysiologist. Like I call him that too. So I say, hey, dad. You know, I've been having fever for the last week, for, you know, since a, a week ago. And it doesn't go away. And they did this and they did that and nothing. And he told me, you need to go to a doctor and you need to demand that they do a blood culture. Well, I went to the doctor here. Nobody wanted to do it. They were, you know, looking at me like I was crazy. But you know how with the medicine, mm -hmm. how you have to, until I went to this doctor that I, I just show him my hands and I said, look, I have heart problem. My cardiologist in Venezuela told me that I need to have a, a, a blood culture, please. And I started to cry. So I guess the, 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 that doctor felt bad. We got my blood culture. Not even an hour, they called me back. You need to come to the hospital right now. I have endocarditis. I spent in the ICU for four weeks. And how old were you? Was, Do you remember how old you were? I was already, th yeah, 30, 32, 34. Okay. That's when my my health started to decline, you know. So I started to go to, uh, they told me that I needed to go to a, to a cardiologist, but I needed to go to a cardiologist that it was uh, a congenital. And back then, that was 20 years ago, they didn't have congenital for adults. So I had to go to a pediatrician. When I went to a pediatrician is when they found out everything. And I was like, well, And let's talk about that everything. Why? Like what all did you learn from that pediatrician? Well, that pediatrician, he, first time that he saw me, I mean, I could see his face. It was like, you know, how this lady still alive? You know what I mean? I was like, and then I said, but you got to explain to me what I do have because I don't know. Mm -hmm. And the guy told me everything that I had and he gave me all the explanation and all that stuff. I was like, you know, why? I didn't know this. He said, well, you know, you, you are now too old to have, you know, the gland and the fountain. And that was a surgery that could have prevent for you to have what you're having. Back then, he didn't tell me that I have Eisenmenger. Just, you know, he was trying to be, uh, he's in the University of Florida. Great, great EP. Mm -hmm. And now he's in the Duke Hospital. Mm -hmm. And he told me, you start to need to take care of yourself. And you need to, and I went there for like a couple of years until they had the first adult congenital heart um, doctor. Her name is Saidi, is her last, Arwa Saidi, Arwa Saidi, and she was my doctor for like 13 years. Mm -hmm. She taught me so many things. And then she involved me with the Adult Congenital Heart Association when they were, I, I think it was like almost 10 years ago. And I never thought that anybody had, you know, the same thing that I do have in my heart. And I start to meet so many people that they are like, you know, that they are, they're hard warriors. And I remember that I went to the first conference that it was in, um, in Chicago. And I never felt so, you know, like, wow, this is, this is what I want to do. I want to, I, I don't want people, I don't want other kids to go through for what I went through. That didn't know her body. I didn't know my body. I didn't. Didn't know what I had. So Dr. Saidi he moved. And for me, it was very difficult because I had to go all the way to Gainesville. And it's like two hours. 
So, you know, I started to go to the Mayo Clinic, but we had a doctor. Imagine, back then, there were uh, an adult congenital heart doctor that came once a month. To the Mayo Clinic so in Jacksonville. They, that was in Jacksonville. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, he was the one. His name is Dr. Amash. He was in uh, Mayo Clinic in, you know, the one in Rochester. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But he would travel to Jacksonville to see patients. And he was the one who showed me about Eisenmenger. He gave me the, you know, all the information. I mean, everything. Well, after that, but before I went to the Mayo Clinic, when they told me that I needed to have a transplant, you need to have a heart and lung transplant. And I'm like, you know, I was so afraid. Yeah. And I went through the whole session of transplant, you know, all the different tests that you have to go. I did a cath, and that cath, I almost died because, you know, the anesthesia, my sats are really low, my saturation. Mm -hmm. Usually my saturation is in the 60s and 70s. So when they put me under anesthesia, it's very dangerous. Yeah. So, you know, they did the whole test, which was the most painful thing. And in my head was all the time, my God, the only thing that I'm going to ask you, if, it's some, if it is for me, let it, it's okay. I will do it. But give me a sign. I always tell God, give me a sign because I, I need to have a sign from you. I remember that after they did all that, they laid, they, they, one of the doctors, not the doc, my doctor, but the doctor that he is the one that transplant. Call me over the phone. Didn't even tell me, come to the office. No, on the phone. Hello, Belen Blanto. I just to let you know that you don't qualify. I just started to cry and cry and cry and cry. And I told my doctor, Dr. Saidi, and she was so embarrassed because, you know, that was such a terrible thing to do. Yeah. So that's when I realized that I needed to move on and mm -hmm. go someplace else. Good for and you. And that's when I started to go to Mayo Clinic. Okay. And in Mayo Clinic, I met the best pulmonologist in the whole world for me. A Dr. Charles Berger. He saved my life. Because and you're still working with them, right? Was killing me. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the Eisenmenger was killing me. I mean. Literally. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember that after they told me that I couldn't have the, the, um, transplant and I start to get sick I used to go every other week I would go to the to the um, hospital I just got very depressed I stay home I didn't want to go out I didn't want to do anything I just you know it was very bad I just I I was just like well you know if, if I don't want to suffer anymore I just want to die I, I mean I was thinking that which I never and then my husband was t was telling me you know, my husband, 23 years. What is that woman that I met 20 years, you know, 15 years ago that was back then, 15 years ago that fought all the time? And I said, I don't know. I just, but it, I think it was because the way that this doctor threw that to me, he said, oh, because you're going to have, you, we need to go ahead and replace your liver too. I'm like, you know, you, you're talking to a human being. Yeah. You're not talking to yeah. a, you know, to an animal so I didn't know what to do I didn't know what to do until one day I don't know why I just woke up and I said Belen you're wasting your life whatever whatever more or less you have to live you just you're not living you gotta do something so I started to you know my husband told me we're gonna move to another house a smaller house I'm gonna make you a closet that this is your dream and me thinking yeah, but what about if I don't make it to... They're always thinking because you know what it happened. When I started to go to the Mayo Clinic, it was amazing. Then I met this electrophysiologist that he moved from Rochester to here. He wanted to get me out of amuterone because that's a medicine that is very toxic. Oh. I had an ablation. They could take the, the, the flutter, the atrial flutter, but the atrial fibrillation, they, I'm in AFib all the time. I'm all the time, you know, my AFib is all the time there. It didn't work. But 
you know, I trust him so much that when he told me I want to do an ablation, I was like, okay, let's do it. And I did pretty good. I did pretty good. And then, you know, I start to gain trust and, you know, that I wanted to do stuff and I wanted to help. And then I start to get like very involved with the ACHA, with the Adult Congenital Heart Association. I opened a channel in uh, in Instagram called You Don't Have to Look Sick. I used to put, you know, like me- tell them, okay, you know, you have, when you have a heart disease, your lips are purple. Let me tell you about this lipstick. This <laughs> lipstick will help you. <laughs> So, you know, I made my channel, you know, Mm -hmm. but everything was about, you know, heart disease. Mm -hmm. Then the pandemic got to here and I'm doing, I keep doing my channel. And then I receive a, I receive a message from a lady from my country, uh, Venezuela. She say, hey, I'm looking at your channel. It's amazing. My boy was born with the same thing that you do have. And in Venezuela, I don't know where to take him. And I say, okay, let me go ahead and I call and find out and then I help you. And then, you know, you can, of course, in my life, no clue what it was happening in my country and all over the world. So, you know, I call my electrophysiologist and then what I did, I called the son of the doctor who saved my life. That he's a professor in the you know, university in Venezuela of congenital heart disease. Oh wow! So we just, but I knew him. He was. We are almost the same age. So for me, he was my like my little brother. Mm-hmm. I haven't seen him since he was little, like me. So I'm like, oh, I can't believe it. He's like, oh, you calling me, everything. And then I said, you know, his name is Doctor Machado too, but it's Ivan Machado Hernandez because he's like the son. So I call him and I say, ah, oh, you know. She said, well, she can go to this and this hospital. Then I called him back. And I said, can you tell me what's going on in Venezuela with a congenital heart being busy? Well, he started to tell me everything. I was in tears. And then the lady called me and told me my son died. He couldn't resist the surgery, so he died. I'm telling you, Boop. For me, it was like my head is like he opened. And I say, wow. I found my purpose in life. Now I know why I'm still alive. Yeah, you did. Oh my god! And I start my I start the foundation, and all my friends from the Adult Congenital Heart Association, the ones that were my closest friends that we were in pandemia, they all gave me money so I can pay for the papers and start the whole thing. And tell us about that foundation. With four hundred dollars, I started my foundation. That's amazing. Well, um, I what's started, the name of it? I started uh, the name of the uh, the name of the foundation is Estrellita de Belén, Little Star of Bethlehem. Oh my gosh! Because of my dad. Yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So we started in the pandemic year. Uh, at the beginning, it was like, well, you know, so hard. Still very hard. But I'm determined, and I that day that I knew, you know, the <clears throat> the reality of in the uh, undeveloped countries how these children are dying, and they don't have any kind of opportunity. There is no insurance. There is not, you know, the government doesn't help them. It's just I said this is what I'm going to do. So I start to ask for money in Facebook like crazy. Please help me, help me, help me, help me. All my friends from the from from you know the the congenital heart uh, association, many of them helped me. And little by little, it's just I start to make. Then in Venezuela, when they found out, oh, there is a there is a foundation organization in the United States that is helping. I have over 400 children right now. Oh, wow. Which what we do with these children is like, right now we don't have the money to be able to pay for surgeries because they are like $40,000. And, you know, 
I prefer to save the life of, of many that take one, just one, and just, you know, that you don't know what is going to happen. So what we do with these children, we pay for them all their medical expense that they need, everything that it has to do with cardiology. Like, for example, they get their appointments, her their cardiologist appointments, they get lab work, they get sometimes high even... People donate me formula. I have some doctors that sometimes they donate me, you know, like medical supplies. Mm-hmm. And I just keep sending boxes and stuff. And, but the most important thing is that we, we can help these children to at least receive care. Because in Venezuela, if you don't have, if you don't have the money, a medical appointment, especially a cardiologist, is a hundred dollars, and which is cheap here. The minimum wage in Venezuela is four dollars a month. Four dollars so, a month. Four dollars a month. The minimum wage. Wow. So these children, there is just two local hospitals that they are from the government. They can give away surgery. The problem is because of the situation in Venezuela, all the doctors has emigrate you know they have gone you know they um we need a cat oh no the machine of the cat is bad so they need to go to private a cat a catheterization in venezuela it costs five thousand dollars which is nothing for here mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but for a person that made four bucks an hour, a yeah. month that's astronomical know? yeah yeah so what we do we have like a doctors that they have become you know affiliate with us for all over the country i just don't do like many foundations they concentrate either the capital or this state no i go all over venezuela so the doctors give us good prices and we can send the children to be seen but we have the problem that after they they've been diagnosed you know diagnosed if it's a if it's a complex congenital heart disease this child either if they cannot find how to leave the country to have you know the surgery in another country they die Mm -hmm. we have uh, since I started we already have like 12 or 13 of our children that are already dead and it's we just like I was telling you on the phone that we just had a, a 12 year old that had a sudden death she had cardiopathy which it's impossible in Venezuela there are no transplants. Mm-hmm. But nobody gave her the opportunity for nothing. And we just we're just trying to be able to give these children everything that they need. Sometimes, you know, they for Christmas, you know, the parents they don't have the money no even to give them gifts because, you know, they need to buy medicine and all that stuff. So, you know, here in my community I try to give you know, toys so I can send it to them. I know that it doesn't have anything to do with, you know, heart disease, but I don't know how long these babies are going to be alive because they don't have treatment. Mm-hmm. So the only thing that we want is that with a very small donation, we can do so many things. We can, you know, the, the medicines in Venezuela are very, very cheap. They're more cheaper than here. Mm-hmm. And as long as we have a, you know, a medical, you know, recipe, it's, it's okay. They can go, if, if we can go and buy the medicine for them. I need to send a lot of, right now, like vitamins and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Supplements. For the kids, because mm-hmm. supplements, exactly. Mm-hmm. Well, we need to send supplements. Like, for example, one of my, one of my dream is to be able to send to every kid an oximeter because they're not they were local hospitals that they are you know in the area they don't have oximeters so i want every mom that we we do have with our kids to have their oximeter i just got like five and i little by little i always ask people oh how can i help you get me oximeters Mm -hmm. (laughs) what i'm hearing you say is you're you're really you may not be able to necessarily provide a surgery for these kids but you're working to improve their quality of life exactly and another thing 
if a child has, like for example, the wolf Parkinson white, which is, you know, that little, it's a congenital heart uh, defect that is just that you have an extra beat in your heart that you just have to do an ablation. We have a hospital in Venezuela. It's a private hospital that we have an alliance with them and they're very good. And uh, that's, you know, that's their specialty, everything that it had to do with electrophysiology. And they give us like, for example, that's uh, an ablation in a, <clears throat> in a hospital, in a private hospital is around $10,000. This hospital, because we have with alliance with them and everything is, they're amazing people. I can pay $2,500 and save a life. So, you know, I don't have to have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. We just need to have the money to take them to the doctor, to buy them their medicine, and to be able to do sometimes. I have, now I have a girl with Wolf Parkinson White, but since we don't receive donations, I need to pay for whatever we have. I need to pay my other kids to go to the doctor because they need to go to the doctor. I had a kid that it has uh, like Kawasaki, you know, that Kawasaki uh, is something that it had to do with the heart and the brain. I don't know, but she never took her son to, in, a, in a, a, she was in a town in the middle of nowhere that she had to even go ahead and go in a donkey and go down to the city. And then, I mean, like unbelievable. Wow. And that child had the opportunity. He had, he went and, you know, we we gave him his medicine and he's doing great because he can live with the disease, but he just needs to have the treatment. It's like in Venezuela, every year, 6,000 children are born with congenital heart defect. Less than 20% receive their treatment. Now that's a staggering statistic. So for us, we feel like we are the everything for them. Like, for example, the mom, I have a lot of contact with the mothers. It's not like, you know, the, the, this typical foundation that, are, oh, I send you $10, but I don't even know who you are, or you know. Well, first of all, we don't send money. We just pay straight to the people that we need to, you know, the doctors, mm -hmm. the hospital, because, you know, you need to keep everything under the law and all that. So, you know, we don't. And I have... I have mothers, and right now that that's what I'm doing. I'm I'm trying to teach the moms that not only they have to take care of their heart, they have to take care of the kids' teeth. Oh yes, directly connected. That goes straight to the heart. Mm -hmm. And I have to pay now dentist appointments, <laughs> but I can say no. Uh, you know how much it cost me a dentist appointment in Venezuela? Twenty bucks. How am I gonna tell them no? Right. So the only thing that I want and that I invite everybody and now that I have this way that I can say what we need, it's just that if you go to our page and make any donation, you helping those children, you saving those children. And, you know, it's so little, but it can do so much. For example, a little box of propanolol, you know that propanolol? That here is very expensive in Venezuela costs two dollars. How many boxes of propranolol I can call I can buy mm -hmm. if I have the money and take care of all my children that take that medicine. But it's the best thing that I have ever done in my life. And now that I'm with Global Arch, we went to the the ACC two three in the American College of Cardiology. We went to that conference. It was amazing, amazing. And now working with Global Large, it has taught me so much about how congenital heart defect is not important. Like everybody talks about cancer, everybody talks about something else, but we are invisible. Then, so, you know, we always, I always say we want to make visible the invisible. You see, I mean, you see me in the street. Can you tell that I have congenital heart disease and, and you know, that I'm dying? <laughs> Or, you know, that I have a syndrome that it can kill me? No. You can't tell but at all. everything. Well, mm -hmm. my, my kids are the same. Mm -hmm. You see them, you know, walking or trying to do. And, you know, it's amazing. But people, if they don't see the children, you know, with uh, tubes and stuff and whatever, it's like, 
And it's not that. These children are suffering all over the world. They don't have anything. And many people in other countries just like me are doing the same thing for their children. And it's really hard. But even that it's very hard, and this time it has been very hard because of the situation that we are right now, the economy and all that. But I'm not giving up because I know I'm going to find company or somebody that it will become my sponsor. I know that it's going to mm-hmm. happen because what we're doing is something good, is to help people yeah. and to help children, that they are the, they are the future of our country. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, they're the future for sure. And yeah. speaking of immediate futures, with your current, con- like, what is your current condition for your health and how are you managing it at the moment? Right now, I'm taking my medicine. I'm taking two medicines that they are for my lungs. That is Ambiorstam and Tadalafil. I'm going to tell you something. To live with this is really hard. Mm-hmm. To live with, with, with pulmonary hypertension. I think it's worse than having than having a AFib because I'm in AFib all the time. So mm-hmm. you know I'm very used to mm-hmm. like I I feel my heart all the time. When I don't feel it, I don't hear it. I get scared. So they let me. I get you know many times. You know right now, I have to do like iron infusions. I need to take care of myself. I have to eat very low in salt. I take a lot of, uh, like, Humex. I take, like, maybe, like, 20 pills a day. (laughs) But always, I think the most important thing that you can have when you have a disease, a chronic disease like that, is an attitude. You need to have a good attitude and just keep going. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Don't let, and and this is what it worries me when I see some people from the uh, heart you know, from the heart disease community, you know, attached and so worry about what they have. They know every minute, every second, every, it's like their lives are involved in that. Don't let that your disease to get to win you. You fight that disease and you will go ahead and succeed because you are stronger than CHD. I be, I totally believe that. Yes. I'm clapping for Bellin right Just, now. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're right. You're right. Live anyway. You can let you can let that uh you know that disease to to get your body because you know a lot is here in your mind. Like for example, I'm in constant heart failure. Do you think do you think that I st- the whole day <gasps> I can breathe. <gasps> I can breathe. No. No, I know I can't, but I'm gonna try to. I take my pace. I always, if I'm if I feel you know like tired, I lay down. I just take my time. I easy, easy. And I you know my thank God I have a great husband that has to learn that you know that I have my own pace and you know he respect that. That's why I don't wash and I don't clean. <laughs> great reason to get out of cleaning See, oh my god but you know my husband is in the military he was in the military for many years he already retired from the military mm-hmm. so he's very organized so my gosh that kitchen is always great looking <laughs> my bedroom everything <laughs> And your closet, uh, Bellin is recording in her closet right now, and it looks amazing. It's like, if only yeah. if only my closet could look that way. Wow. Well, you know, I, I feel like I say this every interview, um, but I, I know I've made a, a new heart friend. You are such a shining light. You are so appropriately named. Um, I... I just am thinking about all the kids in Venezuela and around the world that are so lucky that you are still with us, that you are defying all odds. This this is why I do this podcast. It's to tell stories like this where I, I have the chills right now. It's like you are living anyway. You are living despite your 
condition. And not only are you living, you are thriving and you are living on purpose for the benefit of others. And I just think if only even half of mankind could do what you're doing for others, this world would be a such a much more peaceful, loving place. So thank you for being who you are and shining your light anyway. Thank you. I just think that everybody in the world has a purpose in life. Mm -hmm. And you will find it. You will find it in your life. It, it took me a long time to find mine. But. Now that I found it, I've never been so happy in my entire life. Mm -hmm. Well, it Even shows. That I worry and I cry and I cry for them and all that, but I will not change my life. Mm -hmm. If I have to reborn with this disease so I can go ahead and keep helping these children, I will do it. I don't care. Because I think that if I won't have this disease, I will not be this way. And I want to be this way. So yeah. Wow. For me, it's very important. Well, thank you so much. And um, listeners, I'll put all the ways you can find Bellin in the show notes and on my webpage. And I encourage you to to go find her to make a donation. It It's just so important. And as a fellow heart warrior, you know, I'm one of the lucky ones where I was able to get health care. Bellin was lucky. She can she got health care. She continues to have health care, but there are so many people who don't have access. So thank you for considering making, making a donation. And that's our episode for today. Thank you so much for spending a little bit of your day with me. If you enjoyed this podcast, I sure would appreciate if you would go to my website, theheartchamberpodcast.com and make a donation. Also, if you are a fellow heart warrior, I'd love to hear from you. Would you like to share your story on this podcast? You can either send me an email at boots at theheartchamberpodcast.com or you can go to my website and go to the contact link and leave me a message there. There's also a way to leave me a voicemail on my website. I'm so glad you joined me for today. Please be sure to come back next Tuesday to the Heart Chamber podcast for another inspiring episode.